Hello, it's Tim from Toy Tinker Tim. In this episode, I'm making some repairs and minor restoration on this Hasbro G.I. Joe figure. It's a historical toy item, not just because of its place in the lineage of G.I. Joe, but this is the first figure to actually be named an action figure. This figure has 19 points of articulation. And due to a combination of aging uh, infrastructure consisting of elastic metal hooks, rivets, and plastic against plastic friction, he's gotten a little loose in the joints. There's some rusting on rivets, but some rivets still have a decent amount of original paint on them. I'd like to keep as much original elements on this figure as possible. I want this figure cleaned up, but not going for a factory new appearance that, given its age and origin of being a toy, uh, would look a little unnatural for my display purpose. You can see rusty discoloration on the hip balls, and that's a pretty solid sign of uh, rusty hooks inside the figure. Uh, these are toys that became collector items, so figure conditions are expected to show wear from play and adventure. What elastic I can see through the connecting sockets is discolored and rusty. Uh, rivets aren't too bad. I think there's more dirt and grime uh, packed into those spots on there than there is actual rust on them. The head has not only paint loss, uh, but in the front where there's paint loss in the hair, it's also a scuff in there. Uh, but I believe that will be pretty negligible uh, when it is painted. The brows are worn down a bit, and uh, the cheek scar and lower lip also show some signs of wear and paint loss. For the hair, I want it to be a touch-up painting instead of repainting the entire head. Uh, again, I want to keep as much original and intact as possible on this figure. So these early G.I. Joe figures have different versions of the stamping that you find here on their right butt cheek. Uh, you can use this then to estimate the time frame of manufacturing. So this figure has the double R and patent pending. Uh, the registration mark after G.I. Joe and after the word Hasbro. So that would put this figure into a 1966 production time frame. Uh, that copyright year of 1964 is just that. Uh, that would be the year it was copyrighted, but not made. So it's time to get down to some business with this figure. Uh, there are two sets of elastic inside. One set that runs between the arms and another like a inverted V-shape and that runs down between the neck uh, the headpiece there to the individual legs, the left and the right legs. I'm going to start disassembly with the head and leg section here first. So the object is to pull the head up far enough from the body. Uh, so you can unhook the wire that's looped over the rivet running through the neck post. So I'll pull the head section up and out and then I clip the uh, hemostat which is a very critical tool I'm using throughout this episode. I'll clip that onto the wire section that I pulled up.
after clipping it up in place uh, tilting the head and sliding it off the hook is all that needs to happen next So now with that detached, the whole lower body system slides away from the figure. So the, that hook is very rusted. And as I look into the inside of the figure's upper thighs here, where the elastic is attached uh, to the metal with these eyelets, um, they attach to the rivet-like pins here, these rivets that run through the thighs. There seems to be a ton more of rust there as well. Um, yeah, the thigh rivets are just very rusty. The eyelets have a uh, solid connection around these rivets, which means something is going to have to give for me to clean and restore these areas. There's a little loose plastic uh, here. It's either from the trimming originally of the torso after molding or from playware, uh, just from plastic against plastic friction. And uh, I'll clean that off. The process for removing the arms will follow similar to how the head and neck posts were removed. So I'm pulling the arm out straight uh, from the torso and then using the hemostat again to clamp and hold the rusted wire. As much rusty wire encountered in this restoration, it might be a good idea to wear some gloves. Uh, tetanus isn't from the rusty metal, as it is from possible elements that might be on it. So just food for thought. Okay, with one arm unhooked, I just pull the other arm through with the elastic attached. So these hooks are pretty rough too. Um, the elastic is heavily stained uh, from the rust and they're frayed out here at the uh, unsewn ends. So I want to keep the upper thigh, uh, the pins in place. So I'm going to cut out instead the eyelets uh, that the elastic is hooked into that are attached. I know these rivet thigh pins are very rusty, but with the uh, stress cracks already forming near and around them, uh, I don't like the idea of adding additional pressure or force to the plastic around them by cutting them out and replacing them as well.
So these tiny snips, they're great for reaching in and uh, clipping out a section of the rusted eyelet here that the elastic attachments are on. So by going through this, you know, actually cutting these out gives me a great idea for how I can replace them and reattach the new elastic later in this restoration. Now you can purchase kits with the elastic and new hooks for restringing these figures. And that could be really handy if you're short on time. Uh, I'm willing to take some time on this project. Uh, I'm improving some parts along the way here. And um, so I'd rather just go it alone on this one. Now with all the key sections disassembled on the figure, I can go about my way to begin cleaning, removing rust, uh, doing some touch-up painting on the head. So key tools so far would be the hemostat, a pair of the snips, and uh, needle nose pliers would be helpful too. Going into the cleaning of the figure, I've got uh, two large body sections here of uh, just plastic, and that's going to be some easy cleaning. Then I have parts with a mix of metal and plastic, where multiple steps and products will be used. The hip balls have a lot of rust stains, uh, but that shouldn't be... Uh, too bad of an issue to take care of here. The rivets in connection points at shoulders and neck will be a challenge. Again, uh, reducing the original paint loss in this process. The neck post is pretty stiff. It's locked into place it's not swiveling at all but i'm sure it's from age and sitting in storage the elastic is very worn so i'll be replacing that for sure uh, i'll use the original sections as a starting point for lengths and size the metal hooks, I'll clean rust off and see if I'll still be able to salvage those. I'm trying to move away from really harsh quick fix chemicals with this figure. So for an example, I've got a bowl of warm water and I'll be using some baking soda to scrub these clean with a soft bristle toothbrush. So an interesting thing, uh, when the group at Hasbro set out to secretly develop this figure and uh, do a mock-up prototype, they used the uh, rubber balls uh, from the center of golf balls as hip balls for it. So. Next time you're hitting the fairway, uh, you can think on that one. You can see here the baking soda has done a great job scrubbing off the years of rust and play debris.
So I've taken the upper torso and the lower waist and given them a scrub down with baking soda as well. And that got the uh, rust stains off the shoulder and neck sockets. Uh, you can see the hip balls both have cleaned up great here as well. So the easy part of cleaning uh, the solid plastic pieces is over. So I'm going to get another step underway which will be to clean the rust off the metal hooks. So like you've heard me say already here, I want to keep as much original on this figure as possible. And that's going to hopefully include these rusted hooks uh, from the neck connection and the left and right shoulders. I'm taking these three original hooks and putting them into a container and I'm pouring white distilled vinegar it's got a 5% acidity over them and I'll be covering this and let these soak for a good three days. Uh, the vinegar will help to break down the rust. The elastic section from the arms is stitched and I understand later years of the G.I. Joe figures had some where a metal band was clamped uh, around the elastic to hold it together instead of the sewing. I'm going to cut the stitching uh, which is with a thicker thread. Uh, that that's what that was done with and it's good to know for when I go to recreate this part later. I'm opening it up to get a measurement which I'll probably slightly modify because of the elastic stretching over the years. So here are the metal hooks after having their bath in the distilled white vinegar. I'm going to go over these with a brass wire brush and some fine sandpaper to uh, work out any other loose uh, debris off the surface, get that material off of there. After that I'm going to saturate them with some WD-40 to uh, temporarily here at least protect them from recurring oxidation. Uh, until I come back to them a little bit later on this project. The legs and arms have some rusty rivets, uh, some worse than others. But there are also some rivets in good vintage condition, meaning they still have that original paint on them. And uh, these are things I want to try to protect as best I can. Now, if you want to label it a phobia, but I discovered inside one of these legs what looks like an old spider nest. Uh, it's kind of a thing going on in there. And... Uh, Looking in there at that, it really creeps me out.
I'm using a paint paintbrush handle on it uh, to break it loose and uh, keeping it all on camera in case anything comes crawling out. It's just some empty, dusty, dirty space beneath the web, which it's all still pretty gross. I don't want to use the vinegar here uh, to treat or clean these because I'm afraid that the vinegar is going to eat at or loosen the uh, remaining paint on those rivets. Um, I had read seltzer water could be used to remove rust and it would be more gentle than the vinegar. So I'm putting my parts into the storage container and then I'll seal it for a couple of days with the seltzer water bath going on there and we'll see what we get. The arms yeah, can, can come apart into smaller sections by design, uh, but with those stress cracks in some of those areas, I'm leery of putting any additional stress by pulling on them to get them apart and then pushing them back together. I feel like it's just putting a little more additional wear on potentially weak spots. I'm not sure how well that worked. Uh, maybe around rivets and plastic it cleaned, uh, brightened it up there a little bit. But the really rusty pins I see seem to be totally unfazed by the process. So I've got an alternative plan in mind here for those. So how I'm cleaning uh, the rust off here, the upper thigh pins, is by cutting some uh, sandpaper into very thin, longer strips. I give it a slight curl at the end there and feed it into the top of the leg there, past the pin, underneath the pin. Then using the hemostat again here, I reach in there and snag the loose end and pull it up and out. Then it's like a uh, sawing process here with the sandpaper. Um, I'll go over it again with a finer grit to finish it off. Um, I also took some of these cut strips, the ones that kind of tore on me as I was going here, and I've folded them into a small shape here square and place that into the tip of the hemostat there and then this way using that i could work and sand on the top edges the awkward corners of the pin
going back to take a look at the hooks after sanding off the rust here I don't want to reassemble the figure without protecting these further so you can see the shiny one compared to the other two that have a blackish blue patina to them that finish is part of the surface it's not something that's simply going to rub off onto the elastic So the way I create that protective finish is by using some 3-in-1 oil and saturating the hook with that. Then I get my butane torch ignited and I want the oil to flame off the wire. I'm not heating the wire to the point where it glows or is superheating. Uh, it's just a good heating. So while it's still hot, I coat it again with the three-in-one oil. I think you can see a little bit of that smoke coming off from the hot wire when the oil hits it here. Then it's a process of just repeating this step over and over until it reaches a good darkened look there. Like I mentioned, this surface treatment isn't just a, like a soot on the wire. It's coated here now, so this should help prevent future rusting. A simple safety rem reminder here, remember to keep your workspace clear of combustible materials uh, when you're working with an open flame or heated items. So I'm going to switch the gears a little bit here now. I'm going to get ready here and start the touch-up painting here for the vintage G.I. Joe head. So I'm using uh, acrylic paints. And my starters here are the raw sienna, burnt sienna, and burnt umber. And then as I mix these, I'm also adding in a retarder, which will extend the drying time. And uh, with a little water, it's going to help to thin out the paint too, so it's not going on real thick and heavy here. It'll help with the blending. And then I've selected these three brushes uh, to get underway. I've got a number eight here. This is the long bristled brush. A number five, which is a gouache brush. And a number 20 round. It's the fine brush. The fine brush is a bit beat up. And it really needs to be replaced. I've rigged a stand to hold the head while I paint it. Um, it's going to stay on this rig until it dries. So uh, even, you know, in between coats, the head has been cleaned and dried before this painting. Uh, so I can have a good surface this way then for the paint to adhere to. So again, my goal going into this paint job is to keep original paint as the majority of what you see. Uh, the touch-up paint is just meant to cover uh, the missing areas. So... I'm looking for paint restoration here on the hair, the eyebrows, lower lip, and the scar, all of which have just varying degrees of paint loss or there's damage. Starting out from my base here, I'm using the uh, dark brown that's the burnt umber. And there I'm adding a bit of the retarder gel to this and uh, mixing those together. So the reason why I like to use the acrylics is because I like the flexibility. Um, Overpainting, smears, whatever, uh, they'll come off fairly easily here as I'm starting out here working on this. And uh, dry time is relatively quick. And cleanup is great because it's you can just use water. Uh, 
a spritz of water to dampen the brush and then work that in a little bit uh, to just give a little bit additional moisture. So as all this mixing is going on, um, I'm going to get into a little bit about the head sculpt, which was made by Philip Kreczowski. Uh, I hope I didn't mess up his name here. Uh, it was a sculptor uh, who created the head for about 600 bucks in less than 10 days. So 600 maybe doesn't sound like a lot, uh, you know, in 1964, um, but Currently, that would go for a little over $5,000. So, not bad for less than a 10-day gig. Um, but when the first here, when the head was made, uh, there was no scar on the cheek. That was added later as production was about to take place in Hong Kong. So, the scar was a device um, added on there for securing the design. Uh, protect it uh, and the rights from knockoffs and bootlegs being made and sold. Here I've got some cobalt blue that's coming in to add a little mixing, a color balancing here. It's not something you'd probably initially think of as a mix uh, to go in there to match the brown here. Rarely do I use a paint straight from the tube, but this raw sienna was a pretty perfect match uh, for that lower lip and the scar paint touch up here. So I'll let the paint set up good for a couple of days before much handling takes place here of the head. Uh, the final result uh, is going to be just for display. Uh, it's not to be handled, so if it were to be getting some regular handling, I would probably put on a, 
a coat of a dull sealer there, uh, acrylic resin sealer, uh, to protect that and uh, the features uh, from getting scratched, getting that paint worn off of there. Now that cleaning and repairs are made, I'm heading into the actual restringing of the figure. Originally, I was looking at half inch wide elastic and uh, changed that to bumping it up to a 3 8 inch wide elastic. The hip to head elastic I've experimented with some ways to attach it, which I'll go over later. The shoulder to shoulder elastic section is sewn, so I've cut and measured the new elastic about half an inch shorter than the original four inch length section there. The thread I'm using is uh, called embroidery thread. It's a little thicker, uh, tougher than just regular sewing thread that uh, you would just do hand stitching or running it through a sewing machine. And just a heads up, there are so many different kinds of elastic. There's woven, braided, and it goes on. I really wanted to look for a thicker, heavier elastic, but wasn't able to find it at this time. And maybe someone knows a good source uh, and can put it in the comments below for a good, thick, uh, industrial type quality elastic. After stitching the arm elastic section, I can slip on the wire hook here. And then I slip that over through the shoulder uh, riveted pin and then work the elastic back through the upper torso. I've used the hemostat here again to snag the wire that's on my elastic for the other arm and then pulling that through out to the socket for the opposite arm. So these ring terminals are what I'm going to use to create the attachments of the plastic to the upper leg pins. I'd gotten this package at an auto supply store in the past. Uh, I'm sure hardware stores carry something very similar to this as well in their electrical departments. Similar to how I removed the original rings, I'll be making some small snips in the ring so they can attach over those thigh pins. So one way I had experimented with, with using these ring terminals was to thread it through the connector's point. I took tape and uh, rolled and twisted that down to make it tapered. Uh, it's pretty tricky. Uh, it takes some patience and uh, what happened is, is I've opted to go with my second approach uh, to actually use here on the final step for the figure, which was much easier. And it actually visually kind of comes in closer in appearance there to the original made version.
So I'm using a pair of pliers to hold the ring end of the terminal. And then I took the needle nose pliers to pull off the plastic shell like casing off that terminal. It's the blue plastic part. Here's what I'm trying to pull off. It's a bit of work to get that to pull off, uh, but it will come off just patiently and carefully pulling at that. After I got that plastic outer part off, I took the hemostat tip, which is the one I have is very narrow. I forced that into the metal closure to kind of pry that open, open it up some. It gave me a greater gap in there to work the elastic in. Now I can fold and pinch that elastic and pull it through that metal closure. And then once that's pulled through and set, then just squeezing that metal furl back closed onto the elastic. So I'd taken my snips and cut out some gaps in the ring terminal, uh, similar to how I removed the rusted ones, but these snips, uh, the gaps are much closer uh, to the base. They're close enough to the elastic ring base here where it won't unhook from that uh, hip pin on the figure. So now it's time to reassemble the elastic through the lower body section here. I've got those rings on there, uh, the ring terminals. And then using the uh, heavy wire hook, um, I'll run that down through the upper torso there. And I'll pull the assembled lower body elastic rig up through the cavity of the action figure here out through the shoulder neck opening and then that way I can finally reattach our restored head back onto the body So it's been a pretty interesting restoration process on here. Uh, you know, between vinegar, uh, getting into some fire here with the oil, uh, acrylics to paint, baking soda, um, even seltzer water, uh, kind of covered a whole range of things here. So uh, it's needless to say, a pretty interesting project. Uh, using many different methods and techniques here. 
So those are the steps and you've seen the results uh, to the different materials I've used uh, in re doing the restoration and repair here on this classical historical toy figure. Your figure may not be needing as much work as this one, but uh, you can be prepared watching these steps here in case you run into or encounter something similar along the way. Some alternatives to cleaning here, um, some paint mixing suggestions, uh, maybe some new media materials in here um, I've been able to show you as well, things that you weren't aware of before. So this figure is cleaned up nicely, uh, still looks the part of being a toy. That's a collectible versus a uh, made-to-be collectible type toy. The wear on this figure is to me a good sign of uh, adventures and imagination acted out with it. Uh, to me that's a nice thing to see on a vintage toy. So if you've enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it on your social media. Uh, be sure and subscribe so you can get notifications on new episodes. And as a subscriber here, you're more than just a number on the Toy Tinker Tim channel um, here on YouTube. You know, it shows your support for this channel as well. So while you're here, be sure and check out uh, some of my other episodes as well here. And as always, thanks for watching.